Yeah, we're on the air now, Patrick, so you maybe back up a little bit. Okay. The key word in the Bible is being used all over the place in the Bible is creator. Okay? Is that the correct word for out here on planet Earth? No. It is curator. C-U-R-A-T-O-R. We, the living will, the living spirit, are supposed to be the curator of planet Earth. Or the curator of, in our nations that we were born from. Not the creator, but the curator. And we're supposed to be the civil curator. Now, they set up, uh, basically we, uh, we were given that appointment by the district court for most of us when they recorded us into the county records of the Book of Life. Now, they set up roughly 90 days after that an artificial public procreator, curator, person that basically appropriated our assets from us and held them in an estate until for 21 years. That was how long they were supposed to hold them for until we came of age. And that is in the Constitution. That is in the civil law that we were supposed to claim our inheritance at 21 years of age. The other date in the Constitution, which is civil law, is 25. And that's when a man is supposed to be totally free. Okay? No longer in bondage. But they have deceived everybody out here under all of these public and political items by having a voter registration card, by having a uh, having the right to vote at the age of 18. That's public law. That's not civil law. Needing a driver's license. That's public law. That's not civil law. Having insurance on your vehicle. That's public law, not civil law. Civil law a person takes responsibility onto himself. He does not put it under any insurance protection. What will happen will happen. And you have the resources from your estate to basically back up anything you need. Okay, but you have to come in as the civil curator into the Secretary of the Treasury. I found that in Volume 41 of mm. the Statutes at Large, that a curator is the one that has to make a claim, a guardian or a curator, into the Treasury. And we're the curator, we're the living curator. They also have a public curator over there, and that's what they have at the Philadelphia Mint. And the, the Philadelphia Mint is the only mint that has a curator. The funny question is, why does the Philadelphia one have and none of the others? Because the Philadelphia is the du jour mint of the country. Patrick, I'm going to have to uh, mute everybody out. I hear some okay. background background conversations here, man and woman talking to each other. So uh, mute everybody out and come back in with your star. That was me. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm back on. Thank you. Okay. The Philadelphia Mint has a curator. And basically, that was the du jour seat of the government of we the people in this country. 
the public set up government is in Washington, D.C. Now, they moved some of the civil offices over there, but uh, the, still, the basic seat is still Philadelphia. The Mint has the curator. The curator is sitting over our birth weight in gold. That's who we have to go to for our birth weight in gold, is to the Mint, the Philadelphia Mint curator. Okay, so that's one item there. Then all the other items, we have to go to the Secretary of the Treasury, and basically, if you look up in Volume 41, it talks about uh, the Income Tax Revenue Act of 1918, and it also for under internal revenue. Well, one key thing down there is this. For refunding taxes illegally collected under the provisions of Section 3220 and 3689, revised statutes as amended by uh, the Act of 1919, okay, it's talking about that they've collected taxes illegally, and they have from us, from the living. We as the civil, we the people, we do not owe taxes. Carte blanche. So the taxes that have been withheld from us were illegally collected. We have to go in and put a claim in for those. Okay? You can put a voucher in, you send it in as you're coming in as the curator, an American civil curator, to claim those illegal uh, confiscations. Also, out here in uh, the independent, or uh, there is another item in that volume 41, and it talks about the war. Risk Insurance Act. Well, see, we have been in a state of civil war ever since the Civil War. It's never really ceased. The Civil War is between we, the civil, and the public in this country. And the Civil War Insurance Act, okay, was brought in, and they have two insurance divisions out here. One is, uh, let me see if I find it here. One is uh, maritime uh, or marine and seaman insurance, and the other one is uh, army and navy insurance. Okay, here it is. Okay. Uh, the Bureau of War Risk Insurance, a division of marine and seaman insurance, and a division of military and naval insurance. Well, a division of marine and seaman insurance is basically the Social Security insurance side of this war risk insurance that is being held by the Treasury. The division of military and naval insurance is the DD-214 claims for our military bounty and interest that is there. But we have to go to the Secretary of the Treasury and come in as the curator. <coughs> now, we've done these 
Form 56s out here, they are the wrong item. We do not do public forms. Therefore, you should be able to take that form and modify it, even handwrite it out, a notice concerning American civil curator relationship. And then change it around to the name of the public person for whom you are uh, acting, and then you are going to be the civil creator, curator, and then authority for the civil curator relationship is you were appointed by the court upon your birthing. Mine was done seven days after I was born and was done per a valid will of my wish to live. But then 90 days later, they set up an artificial public procreator, curator, person to hold my estate, to appropriate it or procure it from me. And that's what we've done with the uh, EINs is we've declared that artificial public procurator person, person's death. And then we're taking over the civil office over the estate and its assets that same day that we declared him dead and got that estate EIN number. <coughs> so you make up your own forms, okay? And we are operating under private international law to go along with the civil law of the country or of the nation. But we have private international law. You can look that one up in the dictionary. Okay? You can also uh, do a search for it. Now, there is an office out there that we're going to need to go to, and it's called uh, the Assistant Legal Advisor for private international law. That office is in the Secretary of State. Okay? And basically they cover the following items. Commercial law, judicial assistance, arbitration and judgment, family law, wills, trusts, estates, and general resources. They're an advisor. And basically the private international law conventions to which the United States, U.S. dot, is a party. Now, when we go to this place and we ask for their assistance to bring about the full closure of our items, okay, so if you do a search on uh, the website and just search for assistant legal advisor, you should come up with this uh, web page off the Secretary of State. They have a fax number there that you can call or you can send a fax into requesting their assistance. The fax number is 202 776 8482. Okay, you get the address off the website. But first three digits of their phone number, that uh, was pretty interesting. 1776, just mm -hmm. one off. So we're right there, okay? I don't care what anybody else says. We know we're there, and we're knocking at the door. They know we're there. You have to resend all of your underwritings out here. You need to get rid of all insurance. Okay? You need to start taking responsibility for your actions. Okay? You've got the estate. You run into a problem, you send the bill into the treasury. 
as you are the curator and you are appropriating the funds to make up the difference for that. But we have to come in as the curator, okay, into the place. I thought that they were the ones that were supposed to be the curator. No, they've been the procurator by utilizing our fictional person under that certificate of live birth and under Social Security and all the underwritings. So we need to start standing up to them, and then basically when we put them on the hot seat to fulfill their job in the civil capacity, then they, you're not going to have the traffic tickets. You're not going to have half this other stuff because they have nothing to write their bills against. You get rid of the voter registration card. You shut down these public government political puppets out here of writing bills against our accounts and utilizing our assets to fund their bills that they want to do. You there, Chris, now? Chris? Guess not. Star six, Chris. Uh, star six. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now we yeah. can. Yeah, I was muted out. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I actually, after last week's call, um, uh, did my own uh, due diligence on this stuff, and uh, Patrick is exactly right. We are so close at uh, really finding the most effective manner of getting out of this system. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wasn't prepared for this evening. I was looking for... Um, I was looking for some documents here. Um, what I found this week was the under the state personnel board, and this goes all the way up to the federal government, that um, it was under civil servant commissioner of where they converted this into a completely other beast. Uh, but the beauty about it is I found the manual for the state of California. I'm sure that every uh, state has their own civil servant uh law book of which is exact uh, duties and obligations, exact quotes that are not misconstrued or divvied or doubled by uh, attorneys and whatnot. Fact is, is this civil servant manual I've got has clarified the fact that anybody that's participating as a secondary item to the United States or to the state, uh, in my case, California, that is not a constitutionally based civil servant is an agency and has no authority over the people in any capacity. That includes all your county councils, all your attorneys. It includes anybody that is um, a, a franchise, corporation, DMV. It doesn't make any difference. The beauty about this, uh, I'm going to post it in the window here at the Skype window, and people can pass this around. This is so interesting that there's a section in here that actually describes that the state civil uh, servant commissioner and the state personnel board has the authority as to withdraw funds out of the Social Security. And so we found the exact code. And like it says, I, I feel a little um, unfortunate because I was looking for it and had to shut my computer down earlier and was able to do that. But uh, I found it in two different methods. One of them is, is, is dual um, uh, offices. Uh, I went into dual offices and found out that there's absolutely no way that uh, any human being that has a private business for profit can commingle and be a civil servant. And what we've got here in California is every office from the city all the way up through the state are being occupied, insurrected by bar attorneys that are holding a bar card. They're supposed to be having a license that's issued by the Secretary of State. They failed to do that, and they have no constitutional oath. They have no business dealing with people as if they were a civil servant. This is so huge that just by having this manual and going through this manual and pull out the oath, just a section on the oath, Clarifies that is that you cannot occupy an, uh, a civil servant 
if you occupy a civil servant uh, um, uh, uh, office and you are caught based off of the laws that are in this manual, if you're caught doing anything other than being paid by the Department of Labor, such as dibbling and dabbling, making securities, making profits off that civil servant office, is that you lose, it's automatic lose your civil servant office. And, of course, they did not mention anything uh, so far in what I've studied um, as to punishment for actually embezzling funds in a public office. But they were very clear about this, is that every every office is set with a salary, and there is not to be any accruing of any other form of profiteering in these offices. So Pat is exactly right on. I confirmed it this week that he was he was right on when he was saying it. I'm just elaborating a little bit, is is that uh, a conflict of interest is, is where I started this week, and I started also with the idea that, well, let's just check this out. What is a constitutionally based civil servant? Well, I found the manual, and uh, it, it's impressive to say the least. It, it clarifies exactly what we were guaranteed, what we consented to, what type of contract is the structure of what was guaranteed to us, any other extra extracurricular activity that any of these civil servants are doing is actually doing two jobs in one, and the other one is, uh, as they described it in the dual uh, offices, they said that there's a distinct difference between a constitutionally based civil servant office and a, what they call it a political agenda. They said the political that that was the correction that I came uh, 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 Pat's calling it public but they actually call it and name it as the political uh, agenda the political agenda versus civil servant um, duties and what they're doing is they're superseding and overlaying what would be the bankruptcy and of course California has never filed bankruptcy so what they're doing is they've taken what is the federal level and have overlaid our civil servant offices with this crap and have made slaves out of everybody in the state of California. And there's more, but I'll let uh, Pat take it from there for a minute. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the charge uh, with that conspiracy to defraud, when you allege that, and uh, you can uh, prove that very easily, uh, now that uh, Chris has this other document here, uh, that they are operating in a conspiracy to uh, defraud uh, us for a profit in their, in their position, and that's a two-year uh, prison term and $10,000 fine or both, okay? And uh, but uh, at that point also, we would be able to uh, come in and, uh, under the civil law, uh, come back at them for uh, harm caused to us and uh, use their own laws back against them of 18 U.S.C. 242 and then also uh, 42 U.S.C. 1983, okay, for any harm that they've caused in, uh, uh, in the process. And this goes for any and everything out here. As soon as we have initially declared that we have revoked all underwritings out there, given them notice of that fact, okay? And then we also come in and we allege the conspiracy and we give them notice that if they persist, they are now committing an act of public trespass against us. Pat, um, in these documents that uh, I just uh, posted the the link up there uh, for the personnel department, uh, but they're very strict. They're so strict that uh, they allow the different branches of government to communicate through memorandums of understanding, and anything that's inconsistent to the civil servant uh, constitution is prohibited uh, there are provisions that if legislation wants to review 
a memorandum of understanding is that uh, they would have to consent to anything other than what is um, um, part of what the civil servants are supposed to conduct under the Constitution. That means that when you've got the, the county involved with memorandum of understanding of sharing financial funds back and forth with the judicial system, that is prohibited by law and is an arrestable event because it's RICO and racketeering at its finest when you've got that type of paperwork passing back and forth from the county to the, you know, you've got police officers out there arresting people, uh, get, issuing tickets, robbing them of their homes and stuff like that. And everybody's sharing in that profit, um, including the judge. That means that they're sharing all these profiteering uh, and superseding what would be the the uh, the presentation that the legislation said for memorandum of understanding to happen between these different departments. Yeah, see, they're operating as uh, vagabonds, okay, or panhandlers, okay. Now. Uh, yeah, they've got their cup out. They're panhandlers, and they need us to drop our underwriting into their cup so that they can uh, proceed to uh, go down to the liquor store and buy their booze, okay? They're just panhandlers, okay? Nothing more. The movie Peter Pan is very big in this, okay? Going into the land of never, never, go, okay, out here. That's what they want you in, is in that never-never land, okay, so that they can rip you off. That also brings to light another word that I found in a dictionary. When I was looking up to find out more about pan, I found pandex, P-A-N-D-E-C-T-S. And this was a uh, set of laws that... Uh, I think it was Justantine, back in 533, wrote up it in 50 volumes. Well, what? And see, he was the emperor, but basically they were not valid laws. He wrote these laws up himself, okay? They didn't pass the Senate or the uh, Roman uh, government system. They were written strictly from like a king or something like that, saying, basically, I've got the authority to do this, and I'm, I'm going to do it. Not from we the people type scenario. Or the legislator, uh, the representatives authorizing it, making it a vowed enacted laws. Well, we have the same thing in this country. You have the Code of Federal Regulations, you have the United States Codes, and then you have the state codes. And these were all done in about 50 different volumes, just like what Justantine did back in 533, writing up 50 books of laws. So none of this stuff is new. And see, we're not under martial law. We're under mercantile law, the law of insurance, of surety, okay? That is how they can make their profit, is by surety. And uh, to back up with uh, Pat's talking about, I went and did the investigation, and I found the uh, the Justantine manual, and every one of them were in different languages, and I finally, after a few hours, found the whole codification of the whole set of civil law in English. Can you believe that? I found the whole set. And so I'm going to post that over here on the Skype window for everybody to have. But see, those are those laws that he wrote up, they are the public laws. They're not really uh, the real civil laws that the people have to operate by. They're the Chris? coded laws. Okay. Chris? Yeah. Could you post that in the chat window? You're posting it in the call window, and only a few people are on the on the Skype Oh, I'm call. sorry. Um, I didn't know there was two different windows. Uh, yes. Okay, let me look and see if I can find the other I, I posted. I posted your first one over there, but uh, could you post your other stuff so yeah, absolutely. everybody can see it? Yeah, yeah. And, and, in and, fact, then, uh, and then we'll, uh, if we can, we can 
pull some stuff and get uh, get it up at uh, files loaded to the Yahoo group and over to eConcurrent too. Yeah. Okay. Here here comes the civil laws that are nearly two thousand years old, and this is the full volume that Patrick is talking about in English. <clears throat> here it comes. There you go. It. Okay. Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, yeah, that's so, where that's where the statutes at large are also at Constitution dot org, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Who's that? Oh, it's just Laura. Uh, just listening. Thanks for doing that. Oh, I mean, it's uh, we're so close right now. I mean, I was just telling Pat earlier today. I just feel I feel so excited. We're so close. To getting the right answer here. And, I know, it's uh, very exciting. Yeah, that's the follow up information for the guy that put this together. Okay. okay. Yeah, and I think when uh, uh, we get in touch with that uh, assistant legal advisor for the private international law and uh, tell him what we've done so far and uh, basically ask for his advice. Uh, because he's an advisor, so we asked for his advice uh, how to bring about the rest of the closure of this uh, out here. Like, uh, since he's in the Secretary of State's office, uh, we should be able to get our private international passport through him, okay? Or he should be able to advise us where the offices that we need to go to to get that and see that. Okay, I, I, I did find the address for Keith Logan, Assistant Legal Advisor, Suite yes. 357 South Building. I can, I, well, you don't have email up yet, but I can, and there's an email address also. Yeah, Trish Smelter. S. Yeah. Smelter, yes, Trish Smelter. <clears throat> And you guys would find it very uh, useful is to go into the U.S. Office of Personnel Management is because a few years ago they actually converted the civil servant uh, a commissioner's office into the Office of Personnel Management. And what they're doing is they're actually um, – I, I guess you know I haven't figured it all out yet, but it's like a letter of credit when there is an alleged debt from an authorized uh, servant. Uh, that's being put in there, what they're doing is they're allowing them to be granted. It's called a grant in to their accounts out of your Social Security account. And what were the other two offices? It was the War Powers Act, and it was uh, something else, uh, Pat. We were talking about the other day. I can't remember the third one. But they're removing funds from these mega accounts, and they're placing them in their own personal accounts. And I'm just – uh, I'm just suspecting it's either um, through public well, they're, funding. They're writing, okay, see, we have the certificate of live birth out there, okay, as our uh, estate account, okay, and that was uh, uh, done by the procurator, uh, our fictional person. He procreated that from us. Now, they set up uh, under the Bureau of War Risk Insurance two divisions the Division of Marine and Seaman Insurance, and that is where your Social Security account is uh, attached to. And see, that's really marine, basically, is maritime seaman, okay? And see, you're a, uh, with that Social Security account, you became a maritime seaman on the sea of commercial interest rates. Okay, it has peaks and valleys in uh, the usury of our assets. The other one was the Division of Military and Naval Insurance, and that was for the usage of the DD-214 honorable discharge, uh, but also uh, there is, uh, when a man signs up and... Even uh, you have to read the whole thing. There's uh, if he signed up for the selective service and he even died before uh, he was ever called up, but before he turned 25, 
uh, there is some provisions in that uh, uh, naval, military and naval insurance uh, division that they have a claim against uh, some funds. But you have to sort of read, and you have to be able to start reading between the lines in a lot of this stuff to see what's really going on here. Okay? But, uh, yeah, uh, they've been using our assets out there, and then when you go to the VA hospital or something like that, uh, they're writing uh, another insurance against a claim against that uh, your military bounty account. And they're making a profit off it. The school, the university or whatever is attached to that uh, VA hospital, uh, they're getting a kickback off of it. Everybody in this public system out here is getting profits. They're panhandlers off of your assets. And that happens to be in addition to what they're being paid for of which they're only supposed to collect what is being paid for through the Department of Labor. Anything else that they're doing, such as tapping into your account for falsified claims and whatnot, that is additional profiteering. That is the political agenda. And if you want to call it uh, uh, Agenda 21, whatever you want to call it, I believe it's the Communist Party that's actually doing all this. Well, it's uh, basically the insurance, okay? And basically, it's, a, it's under the merchant law, okay, uh, out here. No, communist basically is, communist means communalism, okay? That's what communism really was, and that was where everybody basically shared in everything. But these guys are not that way. They're far uh, separated from that. They're out there for their own gain. Anybody that has a civil office... They're getting paid from the tariff taxes in this country that come in, okay? That's, that's the first takeoff of the tariff taxes is to pay the salaries of the civil servants, okay? Then all the rest of the tariff taxes that come in go and get divided into the individual curator's accounts, Okay? Now, these civil servants are basically, they don't want that. They want the extra money to come in because uh, the civil side just ain't paying them enough, so they want to have more. So they're out here writing up all these other laws out here to make more money for them. And that's against the law. That people have to know, and that's the conspiracy. And they're the ones that are the enemy to the state of man. By the way, the, the third account that they're pulling funds out of is health and safety. When you stop and think about health and safety, that is the welfare co code and the health and safety code of where all the food stamps and all of the grant money is coming down to the people – for housing and for clothes and food and medical expenses, that's where those funds are coming from. And just like what Patrick is talking about a couple of weeks ago, when they get these wire transfer or these uh, grants coming down, they're going to hypothecate that stuff. It's going to be bonded. It's going to be securitized, and they're taking a major cut of uh, whatever it is that's coming into the state. You can count on it. Mm. Yeah. And see, it's what they're doing. They're coming into these two divisions, okay? They're coming into the Division of Marine and Seaman Insurance, and they're putting a claim in that health and uh, safety, they're, putting, they're saying that they are the curator of that public uh, uh, system, and they're putting a claim into the Treasury against that Division of Marine and Seaman Insurance. And that has, that has to come under that war power or the... Them, uh, oh, it all it all ties right back to this bureau of uh, this war risk insurance. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and see, this is all basically uh, a continuation of the civil war uh, scenario. 
It's a war risk insurance of the Civil War. Between the Civil War of the civil and the public in this country, or the civil, yeah, the civil and the public, or the civil and the political, whatever you want to call it. So, Pat, do you think it's a letter of marquee that they're actually drawing upon these accounts? Is that what you think that they're doing? Uh, they're just putting a, a curator's claim in. Yeah. Okay, when you go into that and uh, about the independent treasuries and uh, look up curator uh, in there, uh, that they have to come in as a guardian or a curator. And see, they're claiming to be the guardian over our health and safety and the guardian or curator over that department and see only a curator can put a claim into the treasury secretary of the treasury's office that's what i found out there is that basically that's that's the only one that can put a claim in So we will also be holding the office of curator as well as principal American we executive. We do hold the office of yes. curator, okay? Yes. Yep. yep. And basically that is all the way back into the Bible. Like I said, the term creator was misused. It was curator. We were supposed to be the curator of the planet Earth when we came and started walking around upon the surface. We're supposed to be the protector, the guardian of the earth. And we it haven't been here, doing too good of a job of it. It says here, uh, traditionally, a curator or keeper is of a cultural heritage institution. So there's your answer right there. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the official definition of the treasury curator is that he's in charge of the buildings. I'm not talking about the treasury yeah. curator, okay? Right. I'm talking about us as yes. the civil curator, okay. okay? We the people are the real government of America, of the United States of America, not these civil servants. They're servants to us. We're the master. We're supposed to be the master, but we haven't been doing too good a job being a master either. We need lessons. <laughs> well, you know, throughout all these papers I've been looking at, Pat, uh, the the civil service uh, manuals, they are constantly talking about war veterans, and you know they've got they've got their hands in the pocket of every one of the uh, the payments that are being made to these veterans each month. Has to go right oh, through the county. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big pool of money, okay? How do you think we build all the damn nukes and all the damn missiles and all the damn battleships and all the aircraft carriers and all the submarines costing $6 billion a piece uh, and everything all around the world and fight all these wars and blow up all these bombs? Where's all that money coming from? It's coming right out of that... Uh, military bounty account that belongs to the servicemen. Yeah, Eisenhower said it. Basically, he unleashed a juggernaut uh, back in the 1950s by giving all this uh, authority to uh, the military, allowing them to have access to all this shit. Check this out, Pat. This is a, a part of the code here. Uh, politics, unlawful solicitation. No officer or employee of the county in a classified civil service shall directly or indirectly make, solicit, or receive, or be in any manner concerned in making solicitation and or receiving any assessment, subscription, or contribution for any political party or any political purpose whatsoever. I mean, this is so beautiful. It, it gives you the code, the enactment, and everything uh, as you walk through this. Mm -hmm. So 
So there's your political. There, there's nothing that these uh, public serv- uh, servants can do. They can't interface. They can't do anything in the political arena, and that includes the Federal, uh, the Federal Reserve Act, the Federal Reserve, the bankruptcy. All of this stuff is prohibited to be in the state. They're functioning the states based off of political agendas. Right, and see, that document now is supportive information when you write up your 3949A against them and turn it over to the CID uh, for criminal investigation. Exactly. Oh, yeah, big time. (laughs) That's why I'm so excited. It's just like, my God, look at this stuff. (laughs) Okay, uh, I think I'm about through. Uh, uh, we'll uh, go ahead and open it up for questions. And uh, anybody that has anything, uh, bring it to the table. Any supportive information, whatever, okay? Uh, put it on the table and we'll talk it over here, okay? So, uh, star six to unmute and uh, uh, state your case. Oh, Pat, before you forget, mention the uh, the legal advisors out of the Secretary of State. I don't think you mentioned that. Okay. Yeah, they're at each. You mean uh, the local sec, uh, states? Well, what we read today is that uh, for anybody that uh, puts any kind of a claim in there, that they have a free legal team there that they will assist you, even if you're under the Witness uh, Protection Program, is uh, that if you have an uh, an issue either internationally and or domestically is that they will assist you with adjudication of those matters and that's right out of the Secretary of State's office. This is the oh, assistant yes. legal advisor doing that? Yes. Uh-huh. It's at, I'm going to post that in a minute. Let me find it. Yeah, Go ahead, yeah, that's Pat. where the U.S. attorneys have to come into play, okay? When you claim this and basically you get them into their civil side of their capacity, out of the attorney general's office, and you put them into the civil side, now they will have to prosecute that because they, anybody out here is really causing harm in the public realm or the political realm. They're causing harm both to the United States of America and you, the living person. So they will basically be the ones to uh, be your... Uh, interface to prosecute the case in your name or in the name of the United States of America. And see, under private international law, okay, the private international law conventions, the United States of America is a party to that convention. So they have to comply with the private international laws. And see, we're in an international realm here of dealing between the civil and the public. That's why we are classified as a foreign entity. Yeah, let me read the first part here. Uh, It says, welcome to the private international law site maintained by the Office of the Assistant Legal Advisor for the Private International Law at the United States Department of State, and it is responsible for the negotiation and conclusions of international conventions, model laws and rules, legislative guides, and instruments governing private transactions that cross international borders. Now, if you're not a U.S. citizen and they're a foreign power, are you not uh, supposed to to address the legal advisors at the Department of State in private Mm. International law. I mean, it's as simple as this. We've yeah. got the answers. Hmm. Yeah, and then basically we move everything up to a civil court case, and those judges now have to operate in their civil capacity of that office, and basically in a civil action, uh, only uh, when harm has been caused, can the civil uh, action uh, court convene. So like your driver's license, uh, that is not 
You have caused no harm by speeding down the road, by not having insurance. You haven't caused any harm. In fact, you've done protection against the country because you're not causing inflation. You're not harming anybody by having this fraudulent insurance out here. Hmm. And the Trading with the Enemy Act brings it home for every one of us is that if you're a non-enemy combatant, you actually fall underneath the manuals for war, and that is is that you're to be left alone because you're considered a civilian and that you're not participating in that war, that they can adjudicate any matters uh, or have any authority over you as a non-combatant civilian. And you can go read it right in the war manual. It says hands off, and that means that under the Trading with the Enemy Act that the United States put out back in 1933, you can damn well bet you fall underneath uh, the um, the legal assistant of the Secretary of State's office. Yeah, but you have to claim that, okay, <laughs> that you are a non-combatant, and they see uh, that uh, you are exempt from uh, the being under uh, their control of the war, and you are a citizen of the. United States of America. So you are a civilian. Hmm. Non combatant. I've got a manual here. I'm going to put it in the window, uh, the Skype window, but it isn't the exact manual, but it does have uh, the definition of a non enemy uh, civilian in it. So I'm just going to post it, let you guys have at it. There's other manuals, war manuals, that are actually more accurate than this one. Okay, thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah, no problem. I want to move this thing down the road here. Yeah. Okay, anybody else out there? Oh, hi, Patrick. How you doing? This is Kevin. Okay. What you I, remember I, talked to you, I remember I talked to you earlier. You said you were going to discuss about the, uh, the 1041. Okay, uh... I don't think we're going to worry about the 1041, okay? Forget all those forms, okay? Okay. Uh, we will just go in, and I posted up in the past uh, several items up there for a bill of exchange, okay? A uh, uh, bill of exchange, and also, uh, let me see, what the hell is the other one? Uh, a voucher, okay? Uh Take those and modify those as a uh, American civil uh, curator voucher, and you pr- present those into uh, the treasurer or the to the secretary of the treasury. Okay, mm-hmm. so you come in as the uh, curator and make your presentment against your estate. Your American mm-hmm. estate. So okay. we just go there. We, we we don't use their forms, okay? You use their forms, you're coming under their control, their public control. So we drop the 1099 A's and C's? I would right now. Okay. okay. Basically, you come in under a civil, and basically uh, you want rectification and uh, any court action, basically, uh, you should be able to resolve that by uh, coming in there and revoking all underwritings and order them to settle them, okay? And you have your 98 or your estate EIN uh, over that, and you come in as the curator, and you order that court to be brought into a civil action or settlement if need be, if they don't uh, dissolve the case right then and there. Now, you can also go back, uh, like, on your house, okay? You can file a claim in against that, uh, against these guys. Under against civil the banks law. Or, or the mortgage title itself? Against the, the whole banks? shit and match, okay? Okay, okay. Anything that de- deals with insurance, okay, 
The mortgage is an insurance policy. The driver's license is an insurance policy. The certificate or the uh, certificate of title to your vehicle is an insurance policy. They're all it's all insured. It's insured products okay. that the DTC needs an underwriter for. And when you stop being the underwriter, then basically they can't process those into their system. And then also if you've taken the underlying collateral away from them, which is your uh, certificate of live birth inheritance, a state inheritance, and all accruals, and the same thing with your DD-214 military, uh, you pulled that off the board with them, and then you file that in, and so you would also, uh, when you've done that with the DTC, and you send notification into your state uh, insurance division, okay, and every state has an insurance division out here because they're writing insurance policies, bond and insurance is basically another usage of bondage in of our assets. And they're the ones that are the beneficiaries. The benefit, he who benefits is the one who is basically the one who is obligated to make the payment. <coughs> We haven't benefited one bit from this shit. They're the ones that have gained all the benefits, the public benefits. Mm. And then we will also, when we contact this uh, assistant legal advisor, we will let them know Give them a copy of what we sent to the DTC and say, okay, what further actions do we need to do to basically bring full closure to the problem that we have at hand? So we will take, yeah, take the, uh, that uh, 1099AV that I had up there, last posting, I think, uh, of that, and modify it. Utilize that as you're uh, coming in as uh, an American civil curator over your uh, estate or over your legacy estate uh, using either the 98 or the uh, whatever uh, foreign grant or trust EIN you have or your a state EIN to bring the full closure of your estate account that your uh, procurator had taken away from you. And then we're going with our uh, our legacy registered account, which is our 11-digit account number, which uh, in most cases, now some people don't have an 11-digit, but basically it is your certificate of live birth registration number, and that is your ADR, American Depository Receipt Account. And then for a military person, it would be under their selective service number, which would be an 11-digit account number, and that would be your military ADR. Hmm. Okay. Other questions? Star six. Okay. Well, I, I was getting ready to redo my 1099 C's and A's and modify my cover letter, uh, and uh, but you're saying put put that on hold right now. Whatever you want to do, okay. I think that the more times we use their forms 
Uh, we're staying into the public realm. You're get, we're giving acknowledgement to their public system that okay. their laws are valid, and basically their laws are not valid. Okay. Okay. So we, I, I should continue on with that, but convert them to our own forms. No, we just need to write up our own document and say, hey, we want all the withholding taxes that have been withheld from uh, that Social Security account. Well, then, then, then uh, basically, you're you're saying we should just go with your re- revised forms and, and liquidate no, everything. No, don't go with my no? revised forms. You're going to have to modify them, okay? okay? I just gave you some new information. Right. You have to put curator on there. Yes. You are the American civil curator. Okay, so you mm-hmm. have to do the little modification. You have to act like a, a creator of a document, and then you are the curator of America. Right. A protector, okay. a guardian of America. Now you're supposed to start fulfilling your job. But you can create a document, your own document. Right. And pull up volume 41 of the statutes at large and go through there and look at uh, several of those items. There's the Internal Revenue of 1921. There's the Independent Treasury. There's uh, the uh, War Powers or that War... uh, War Risk. War Risk uh, item in there. The Treasury Department in there also. Uh, Look that over, okay? And then you'll see also in there about the the uh, mints and the what? curator at the Philadelphia mint. Oh, the mint. Okay, yes. And see, that's one document you're going to have to uh, sort of make up is a claim and have that go into that mint uh, in Philadelphia to claim your birth weight in gold. Now, if you had a hospital birth certificate, and basically I do, it was under gold seal. Well, that is a telling item right there. Okay, it wasn't a silver seal. It was a gold seal. And basically that's the one to where I put my footprints on it. So that, and basically it has my weight and everything else. Now, if you don't have that, you take a Bible, okay, which is one of the foundational documents that this country's constitution was founded upon, was the Bible. And you put your entry into that Bible. It should be between the Old Testament and the New Testament for your birthing. And you should have your birth weight on there, and then you would Take a copy of that page and submit that in as that is your uh, claiming document for your birth weight in gold for the biblical records. Come on, people. I hope I'm not scaring you guys to death out here. No, we're not bring, scared. Bring your answers to the forefront here. Star six for your questions. Patrick? Yeah. Yeah, I had went to the special processing unit in Minnesota here uh, trying to get my uh, certificate of live birth record number. I did finally get it from the person, but they said in Minnesota... Uh, They started changing in 2011, in the upper right-hand corner of the birth certificate is a computer-generated number that they're not using these old numbers. So if people are getting new ones, they might be getting a different number than what was recorded in the courthouses. 
but I did finally get that from her, but she wouldn't give me the new number without filing a form and sending it to her. Well, basically, I went into my courthouse, my birthing courthouse, and uh, I asked to see the book, and uh, you have a right to see that book. Uh, as you're coming in as a civil curator, and you're approaching them in their civil capacity, you have a right to see that book. You don't have a right to see the other information that's on that page, and there's only about on each page, there I think is either three or four entries, okay? And uh, you should be able to see all the entry uh, data that is on that page for you. Right, but what I'm... They told me that they're changing the number because of the fraud that's being committed because they had a numeral system probably by county and by birthing or whatever that created that code. So too many people were cracking that code, so now they're doing a computer generated one. So if people are getting a different number than what has been previously posted like you had on your certificate of live birth, they're changing the numbers on us. Well, they may or may not be. I would use both numbers then in that case when you put your claim into the treasury. Correct. But I'm just throwing that out for information. That's yeah. what I found this week when I was trying to find it. Yeah. And well, thank you. What also, uh, when the public starts seeing that the that the private is starting to crack the code, okay, the public is going to go on a defensive mode, and they're going to try and change things around. Don't that's trust what, them uh, in what they're doing. That's what I'm saying, that they're trying to throw different numbers at us. But you yeah, they're trying, to put, they're trying to throw you off track, okay? Right. But see, that account number out there hasn't been changed, okay? That has to be still the account number that basically that was recorded under. Okay. Right, because when I got the wife's one, they couldn't make it out because it was blurred. But then I called the county, and I had the book and the page and all that, and I asked her to look that up. And the county did look it up and give me the last digit. She said that she could make it out clear. But uh -huh. they have just copy of it also, but I was able to get both my, my mine and my wife's numbers. Yeah, okay. But she was giving me a hint that they are computer generating these numbers at the state office, um, so we need to be aware of that. Yeah, that they're trying to hide it from us, okay? Right, right. They, they started yeah. this in 2011 uh -huh. in Minnesota, that is what this gal was telling me. Yeah. And see, that's what they're trying to keep us in the public as much as possible, okay? Right, but I'm just putting this out there. There was yeah. somebody that had posted something, and I didn't get a chance to type it yet, but that's why I wanted to put it out here on the call so people are aware of that they're trying to hide more numbers on it. Yeah. So they well, could I thank be you for that. I thank you for that information because uh, we knew that that was going to be coming down the pipe. That, uh, right. As soon as we start uh, cracking the code, they will start trying to come up with a new code to try and hide it further and further away from uh, the other people. Right. Maybe they're just creating new bonds and new money. Well, that they can't create it from the certificate of live birth, okay? It's the insurance policies that they need to utilize, the Social Security. And see, that's the same thing with the DG-214. That DG-214 is registered under the Social Security number. To give them access to uh, write their insurance policies or their insured products at the DTC. So when I tell people about the uh, the biblical inheritance or the claim for a birth weight in gold, they go, oh, where did you get that? 
You know, it's like, where does it say that in the Bible? You know, it's like, I can't answer them. I don't know what to say. Well, basically, just go back to uh, uh, the there's accounts in the Bible, okay, about uh, uh, every year uh, the king was to be given his birth weight in gold, okay? I don't know whether that's from the Assyrian king or uh, one of them, but basically, there are entries in some of the books in the Bible about that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then you can also just uh, uh, the Midas touch, okay? King Midas. Okay? Some of this stuff is also out in uh, mythology, okay? Mythology was telling you a lot. Just like Walt Disney has been putting a lot of this stuff out in all of his movies. Fantasia, Peter Pan, Pirates of the Caribbean, Alice in Wonderland. Wizard of Oz. Uh, I don't think Walt Disney did that one, but basically, uh, uh, he might. Walt Disney might have done uh, the remake of the Tin Man. I don't know. I can't remember who did that one. But uh, Walt Disney basically was trying to put a lot of his stuff out to us. Okay, a lot of people claim that he was uh, a mason and everything else and he was trying to deceive everybody no he's trying to help people but people didn't understand his movies that he was putting out there yeah any other comments questions Is this Privacy International law, is that just only at the U.S., or is this at all the states, too, or we don't know that until we check that out? This is to the whole world, okay? Private international law is basically a convention that basically a lot of these countries signed on to. There's two different conventions they had, public international law, and private international law. Private international law primarily covers uh, the civil laws of your country and the civil laws of most other countries and also natural laws that are out there, the laws of nations, most treaty laws, okay? fall into that category. You see, the Declaration of Independence is one of those treaties. Patrick, so we are modif so we are modifying the A's, B's and the A's and C's then. We don't need I wouldn't worry about them for right now. I'd try this other and just go in as the curator. Okay, go into volume 41 and read what it says about curator. You can do a search after you download that statute of large, volume 41, and do a word search for curator. And then read what it says around that word. And then we put our claim into the Secretary of the Treasury coming in as the curator as an American civil curator. It doesn't say that. It talks about Guardian and everybody else being the curator, like for a mental institution. Well, your person, your fictional person, is a mental handicapped person. And now he's dead. So now you're coming in over his estate. Just to help learn to read out. between the lines. Go ahead. Uh, if you open up that uh, that last document, it's at the Statutes at Large 41. You can go to 371 for the War Risk Insurance Act. I've identified that. Uh, I'm still looking for the other one. Yeah, I give you the page numbers, but I just walked away from my computer down to get a cup of coffee. So. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I looked at the, the text generated in, in the statutes at large, and it was a pretty clean character recognition, so there's not a whole lot of misspellings in there. And Anderson's dictionary is hard to search because the text wasn't recognized very well, so uh, it's, it's only about 97% accurate. The uh, statutes look like to be over 99% accurate. Well, in Anderson, there is on page uh, uh, 286, but an actual Anderson, uh, you know, if you punch in 286 and do a search, there is civil court, a definition there that you can read, and it says the court instituted for enforcement of private right and the redress of private wrongs. And then it goes on to more that people can read that too. Okay. It's under civil court. It's under court, so you gotta look up court and then it has a section of civil court. Are you talking about that volume forty one, Marshall? No, he was talking about Oh, Anderson. I'm talking about Anderson's. Oh, okay. I'm in Anderson's dictionary. Okay. And yeah, I have to be looking up service. If you go into service in Anderson, basically you'll find out uh, some very interesting uh, information, and especially uh, 19 or 1883, the Civil Service Act of 1883. Well, basically also in 1862, Abraham Lincoln and basically uh, the Congress they had at that point in time enacted uh, the Civil Service Act uh, back then to uh, address quite a few of these items out here. They knew what was coming down the pike, and uh, so they tried to put the protections in place for the people, but the people didn't see uh, all the items, and they didn't understand the true... Uh, action of that 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was basically a continuation of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. It now became a civil war between uh, the civil side of government and the public side of government. But it really didn't hit full force until basically in uh, the 1913 uh, to 1933 time frame. These judges are starting to, when the guys are starting to put this stuff into them, they're starting to run scared. If you guys uh, go to page uh, 626, they have one for United States courts, embezzlement by officers and the punishment therein. In what book? Uh, that would be the statutes at large. 40. 41, 41 stat? Yeah, go to, uh, it looks like it's, uh, I'm just guessing 630, could be 629. And what was the subject there? Uh, embezzlement of funds by public uh, okay. ju ju judicial officers. Patrick? Yeah. Um, I have a medical bill for my daughter who just passed away three weeks ago of $220,000. Um, how should I dismiss this, write this off? You basically uh, 
revoke being the underwriter for that insurance policy and order them to uh, settle the matter, okay? And that basically uh, that uh, they've already gotten the damn payment. Okay. Okay, so you, uh, uh, if, they, if they have a court action against you? That's it. Okay. You just turn around and uh, revoke being the underwriter for that bill and order them to uh, uh, settle the matter, okay, and uh, that uh, you are claiming a conspiracy to defraud by them, the public corporation, okay, and they're a public corporation also. And uh, that you will take this and you will have this adjudicated into a civil uh, court scenario with civil judges, not hey, public judges. Sort of use that document that basically I put up there about uh, uh, the... Overt conspiracy? Yeah. The overt conspiracy of the 14th Amendment. And when you uh, take several items out of that uh, and uh, look about the conspiracy and about you claim uh, the item, but you also uh, need to claim that you are uh, revoking being the underwriter for any uh, insurance policy. Or you're okay, just being the underwriter for any item out there. Okay, because it's accumulation of doctors and hospital costs. Yeah. The whole ball of wax. They're all public employees, okay? And they're all operating under an insurance contract, okay? okay. These insurance contracts that basically they had, when they write these, we're supposed to be the insured. Okay? okay? We're supposed to be the protected by those policies. But they've mm -hmm. gotten us to be the underwriter. Therefore, they claim that we owe the payment. The insurance okay. policy owes the payment. Okay. Now, one thing interesting, I don't know how this enters into anything, but uh, when they had my daughter signing papers before she, you know, before she got so sick she couldn't sign papers and died, uh, she signed uh, EXE um, without recourse. I don't know if that did anything to help or hinder or what. Well, basically it uh, really doesn't do that much, I'll tell you. You need okay. to revoke being the underwriter, and you need to say underwriter. Okay. Okay. And that okay. Uh, is what uh, needs to be addressed to the DTC that uh, uh, out there. And that, see, I did something back about uh, three, four years ago. Uh, I had a $20,000 hospital bill with two different places. Mm -hmm. And basically, I, uh, uh, they sent out uh, third party debt collectors. And I told those guys, I don't have a contract with you, and if you basically continue, I will press charges against you. Mm -hmm. Never heard anything more from third-party debt collectors, but once it goes to a third-party debt collector, you know damn well that it's already been settled out there. Oh. Yes. They sold it to a third-party debt collector who is now trying to make a thousand percent profit oh. off the deal. And basically it's normally another person, another attorney or whatever, that's in their public system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another panhandler. Mm -hmm. Another vagrant. I mean, they don't do any real labor, okay? 
Mm-hmm. These guys are just out there trying to make a profit off of your labor. Mm-hmm. Extractors. Now yeah, they're vampires. They're blood suckers. Another question. Um, yeah. She she had a uh, pickup that wasn't totally paid for. Um, of course, it's not in my name. It's in her name. Um, how do I legally go about getting it transferred? Um, so I have the legal right to her pickup. Well, basically, you just get it unregistered, and basically, uh, uh, you claim it as private property now. How do I you claim it as inheritance, okay, or uh, a state uh, transfer. You come in as the curator over that property. Oh, really? You become the curator of her estate. Oh, really? She can go yeah, get an EIN. Just, get just an EIN. write it over to you. No, can she, she get an EIN for EIN the estate? Yet. No, she didn't have an EIN yet. But could you okay, get an EIN for Okay, you need to go estate. in and have an uh, EIN assigned to her uh, account. Okay. Okay. And it'd probably be a 27 or something. That's what my dad's, uh, when he died, uh, they made it a 27. Okay. And then uh, you uh, basically just uh, come in as the curator for her estate. Okay, do I make up an affidavit letter? Well, uh, yeah, you can write one up yourself, okay? Now, I strongly recommend that people stay away from any public notary or notary uh, public, okay? Oh. It's got the word public in it, doesn't it? Yes. yes. When did the notary publics come about? They came about out of England. Oh. They're basically part of the mercantile system. Oh. The public system. And basically, all they can do is basically uh, say, yeah, this person's dead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, they're not worth a damn. They're only working for the public side. If you want to be in the private you need to basically just do your own thing and come in there and say, now prove me wrong. Here's who I say I am. Isn't that what Jesus said? I am who I am. Mm-hmm. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Now you <laughs> prove that I'm not who I say I am. Is that why you put it in bold all the time? Yeah. Yeah, and you can use witnesses if you if you think you need them. Well, remember, Patrick does his affidavit with his own his own second person and his fingerprints. Yeah. Yeah. You show your boundary markers, okay? Yeah, four fingers. You said right and yeah. left four yeah. fingers. Index fingers, yeah. Don't you remember back there in the '60s or early '70s about uh, this face is mine? You stay out of my space. I forget what that was all about, but basically there's a lot of stuff out there about that. Uh, you, uh, you're infringing upon my space or my domain. Uh, now, to make up a curate, to, to make up a form or a statement saying that I'm the curator, how do I write yeah. that up? You take basically a form 56 and. Uh, you modify it. You can hand write it out or you can type it out and make up a form that looks something like the form 56. Okay. But you make it up as a private document and then uh, you can sign it and date it uh, down below that you are the curator. Okay. You're the American curator. And you're standing under international uh, private international law. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
also one of the other things when you go after the IRS for all the illegal withholdings that you have, the IRS commissioner you should be submitting that into would be the IRS International Commissioner. And he is located in Philadelphia. Oh, this... This is your seat of government. Oh. Okay, this curator letter, letter I send that to the um, truck uh, ownership, the one, the insurance that has her truck. Well, you can send a copy of it after, okay? You oh. basically do your modification. It's sort of like the W-8 form, okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, several people have come back and said, well, basically I'm getting something back from the IRS saying that uh, you can't use just the W-8. You need to either use the W-8BN or IMY. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, if you're in the public world, that's what you need to use. But if you're in a private world, but uh, there again, we should remove the, all of the IRS uh documents off there because that's a public form. Hmm. So we make up our own private W-8 uh, out here for our exempt status. Mm-hmm. Now I'm trying to get away as away from as much of these public forms as possible because we don't know how tricky these guys are, but anytime you use a public form, you're basically acknowledging them as being valid documents, and they're not. Mm-hmm. They're a deceptive document. They're keeping you in the dark. Uh, hey, Patrick. Yeah. Years ago, I put in an affidavit um, that um, was titled in lieu of a W-8-B-E-N. And it didn't even have the look of a regular form. It was just an affidavit form. Uh, I have a question. Now, now, wait, before you go off, okay, uh, on that W-8, you're going to have to probably go back and modify that and get the word uh, that you are the American civil curator over that account. Okay. Yes. Okay. You want to get that word curator in there, that you are the creator or curator, okay? Okay. Okay. Now you're in touch with God. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Grounds of dominion. Yeah. Okay. Right, my Next. question is, is, is since, since we're not, I mean, oh, no, let me, let me slow down. Since, since, since everything we're going to be doing from now on is going to be in, in the private, where is the private place to send these forms to? You send them to the civil office of uh, the Treasury, Secretary of the Treasury. Hide them out there. You send them to the civil offices. You start communicating with the civil offices. You don't communicate with them in the public. So you always have to use that word civil office in uh, all your correspondence that you're dealing out here. Is that a different address? What? Is the civil office a different address from the public office? No. Okay. Now, many of those guys that are in those offices are just wearing two hats. Okay. We've heard that said about Hillary and uh, uh, the Secretary of State's office and uh, several of these other offices that they wear two hats. I think Obama's only wearing one. I think he's only wearing the public side because I don't think he can be wearing the civil side Okay. <clears throat> Any 
other questions out there? Okay, okay, Patty. So, and, and, and since I am the curator, I can send my creative forms to the civil side because I'm a GOD. Yes, you can send basically a voucher or a bill of exchange into uh, the Secretary of the Treasury to uh, make payment as the curator. See, that's what you'll find when you uh, 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 read uh, the document out there, and uh, that when you're coming in as the civil curator, not a public curator, uh, basically you give them, I would give them 24 hours to make uh, good the obligation. They've got the means to basically turn it around overnight. I mean, basically wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, type situation in the process. They have the Secret Service located in every state capital. They have basically a branch office uh, of the Federal Reserve Banking System uh, in each one of the state capitals. So the funds can be basically transmitted uh, and delivered within 24 hours when you put your claim into uh, the Secretary of the Treasury. Or to the IRS Commissioner there in Philadelphia, the International IRS Commissioner. And you approach them in their civil capacity, civil office. Do I send a letter to both the Treasury, I mean to the IRS about my daughter, as well as to the, um, I don't know where else, to the... The DTC, you need to send them a notice that you are uh, have all underwritings for that account are basically terminated and that you are ordering uh, the underlying uh, leasing uh, document or collateral to be uh, pulled off the shelf. Okay. Okay. And that you are uh, claiming that uh, as the curator. Okay, so we need to revise those faxes a bit, but we still send out the same faxes with revisions. Yeah. Okay. And we address them to a civil office as much as we can. Yeah, to the civil uh, office in uh, that uh, uh, fiscal agent office in yeah. uh, the DTC. Right, and we got the Social Security Administration, all, all the people who were, were four of the people were copying. Yeah. Does the DC, does the um, addressing of the underwriting to the DC, DTC, cover all DTC, the IRS yeah. as well as everything? Or do you have to send uh, multitudes of letters out? Well, uh, I would also send in to the state, okay? Okay, See, they will utilize her assets for up to 10 years. Oh. Yes. Ooh. That is what they can utilize, the assets, after somebody has died. Oh. Okay. See, that's what they're they're still trying to do, even though we submitted the uh, the SS4 and uh, declared our person dead. We haven't still got that out of their hands yet, so they can still write bonds against that account for up to ten years. So, what is the final step to stop that? Well, that's where we have to go to the DTC 
and we also have to notify our state insurance commission that basically we are revoking all underwritings against that account. Therefore, they do not have an underwriter for their bonds for their uh, insurance policies. I see. Okay, so now they don't have an underwriter. They can't be processed through the DTC with their bonds. And then okay. also when you, uh, you back that up by taking the collateral off the table, now for sure uh, they can't write any bonds because there is no collateral to back up the bonds. Mm. See, that's just like your vehicle, your title uh, to your vehicle. You gave them the vehicle mm -hmm. as collateral. You put your vehicle up as collateral for them to write their insurance policies, their insured product policies, against that vehicle with that certificate of title. Now, all the bills and everything that come into that vehicle are supposed to be paid by that insurance policy. Mm -hmm. But we've never done that. They turn around and try and get us to put extra insurance on that vehicle. Well, hell, we've already got one insurance policy on it. Now we're putting double insurance onto the vehicle. It's all an insurance scam. Public insurance and all these panhandlers out here. Hell, the biggest thing out here, even bigger than the banks, is the damn insurance companies. They're the ones that have all the new buildings. Mm -hmm. And then they got everybody out here wanting to be an insurance salesman to get a commission to fleece your fellow mankind. Okay, anybody else with any comments? Yeah, Patrick, what is the name of the uh, thing that say you can uh, uh, modify your own form? Because I want to put that in, in my document. You don't need to have anything. You can modify anything. You are the creator. Yeah, I mean, okay, you know, okay I'm just you thinking don't about need. You don't reference any public statement, okay? Okay. You reference a public document, a public code, a CFR, a United States code, a state code, and you're giving acknowledgement to their fraudulent laws. You want to be in the private? You be in the private. You have the authority, not them. Okay? Yeah. Hello. What about referencing the estate number? Speak up a little louder. Sorry. What about referencing the estate number, the numbers that they've issued us? Yeah, you will reference that, okay? Okay. Yeah, you've got to reference uh, the estate, but you also oh, that's what reference. I huh? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You you'll reference the two accounts that they have, which is one is your Social Security uh, insured uh, account, and that one will basically be. Uh, all the withholding taxes that they've withheld from you illegally, okay, out there. And that's the one that goes to the, IR, to the IRS International Commissioner when you send your documents to him to basically close down that side of that estate, all the withholding taxes. You will also reference uh, to the treasurer, uh, the certificate of live birth 
uh, account as an ADR, an American Depository Receipt. And also, uh, you also have an ADS, which is American Depository Shares of Stock in all these public corporations. And that's under the same uh, number, that Certificate of Live Birth Registration number. Go ahead. Uh, this is Marville, alias Libram X. So in so many words, you actually saying uh, something that we should already know has just been stolen from us, that we are the creators and actually by using their forms, which is in a way is public, just like you said, but those are copyright forms that we should actually create our own forms. And I mean, we can still use the wording to get around, but send it to the proper channels. Now, that's, that's, I got that part of what you're saying. Uh, that's, that's not going to be too difficult to do. Uh, the, the other part is that many of us have already sent in like the 56 forms, and we can just send in the new forms to the proper channels and just use uh, the wordings that you've been giving us once we look up these wordings, correct? Yeah, and basically you could just put a statement on when you uh, that you revoke all other public uh, submitted documents. Okay, okay. That's see, that's exactly what I wanted to know because yeah. a lot yeah, of just, a lot of things yeah. you was doing, a lot of things you was doing and telling telling the group in the past. A lot of times I just remodified many of the works and sent them in. That's that's why I said none of my items has ever come back. None of them. Yeah. Yeah, okay, because so. we're dealing with the public and they can't communicate with the living. Right. I, I mean, I, I even read, um, before you even spoke of it tonight, someone posted it on the group about um, about your very discussion tonight. I already read it. And I was like, wow, now this, some, this is some, some parts of it I was aware of it, but the rest of it, uh, so I'm going to look it over again and I plan on using a lot of it, you know, just to, because this is almost like the simplicity because their stuff, they purposely make their stuff complicated. And they, even if you get it right, they're going to deceive you on it anyway. So why use their stuff anyway? Because a lot of us don't know that that's actually a copyright infringement because it's their work. It's not yours. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. See, that's why in a lot of cases you put your stuff under uh, letter patent or letters patent, and basically now you control that document. Uh, so basically they can't uh, put that out unless you give them permission to put it out. Right. That's why you do things in the private. Like, uh, yeah. like one of the stories was like going – you know, go to judge chambers, tell them to take off his robe, look at it. You only speak it to them uh, as that one individual, not a group. And then uh, he can go out there and say anything he wants to, but he cannot present that. Why? Because it's private. That's why. <laughs> so, See, that's so, where you need to get them into, the, into their civil capacity. That's yes. the only way that they can talk to you is in their civil capacity. Yes. Patrick, do you think that uh, dealing with a court case, it would take in chambers activity for it to become civil as opposed to the public or the uh, political arena? Uh, repray, or state that again. Would you say that in order to elicit a court would be an in-chambers activity as opposed to the public forum as the political arena? Yeah. If uh, When you address that court… Uh, that uh, you are going to move this into a civil action and uh, that you want to uh, have this settled behind closed doors, uh, then that judge is going to have to take off his robe and uh, uh, act appropriately, or basically uh, you're going to move it up to a higher court. 
And for that gentleman that was just speaking, what Pat was talking about is your signature is a patent. If you go to international law, international law has recognized and acknowledged universally throughout the world that your signature is a patent. That means you have every uh, power and authority as to do as you deem fit. That means that it has to be acknowledged, just like what Pat is talking about, is when you set forward a revocation of your underwriting, uh, it's just like uh, the patent on your signature is that you don't give consent for any other use other than what your expression of that usage was. Anytime that they take a promissory note and convert that and prostitute it, they have actually gone against the will of that signature patent, which is another issue that can be addressed in court cases. Yeah, you've got to use the, the terms will and wish. It is my wish that this be done. Or it is by my will and wish that this is to be done. And those are two powerful words in uh, this uh, whole process. And see, uh, wish basically was in a lot of the uh, mythology out there. Uh, trying to tell us about things, too. Words are very important, okay? And that's why you need to really utilize the dictionaries as much as possible. Uh, and like I said, uh, Anderson basically, I think, has a pretty good handle on most of the words, but in a lot of cases, you're going to also should have an Oxford Universal or Webster's uh, old dictionary uh, to get a handle on a lot of words that aren't in the law dictionaries. Hmm. Also, Patrick. Yeah. Well, when you were saying uh, earlier ago, copyright, um, since every last one of us happened to be so special, because to prove how special we are, we all have different fingerprints. That is also our copyright signature, is it not? Now, everybody signs slightly different, okay? Yes. And then when you throw your fingerprint on top of it, basically that almost solidifies uh, to uh, voting, okay? And you're doing a vote when you put uh, two of your representatives onto a document. Yes. I remember the past when you said those are also your two witnesses. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Is there any hope of your Internet getting up, Patrick? I don't know. They're working on it. Uh, it's uh, some damn equipment uh, in the phone system there, but uh, I don't know how big of an outage it is or how major of a equipment problem it is, but basically it's still down. So. Uh, sure taking a long time. They're usually faster than that. Uh, it all depends. They have this damn equipment that uh, some of these damn phone companies and everything else have bought and basically is a piece of crap. Oh, that's true. You had a lot of ice uh, problems in, in your area for power, didn't you? Well, that, but I think also some of the damn equipment basically is a piece of crap, okay? That's Just true. like a lot of the vehicles, okay? Uh, you could take a 1957 Chevy, and basically that damn thing could run forever. Uh, but basically, one of these new vehicles basically would last for maybe three years. True, true. Building no. obsolescence. No. They're not built to last, okay? They're built to break down so that they can have repairs because that's where the money's at, is in repair. I have a question. Um, yeah. When we sign our names, have you... Um, <clears throat> we... We're told to sign our last name first with a semicolon, then our first name. Do we do no. that? No. Sign your uh, Mr. or Mrs. and then your uh, given name, okay? 
okay. and then semicolon, and then your clan name, okay? Not your family name. It's your clan or tribe name, okay? Oh. When you turned 21, you left the family. You were supposed to have left the family because basically family, when you look it up in the dictionary, basically is a household servant. You were a servant of the household until you came of age. That is what a family member is. So you don't want to use the term family because oh. in that, if you use that, you are claiming that you're still a family servant. Oh. See how tricky these guys are? Yes. Okay, so it's my given name, semicolon, then my clan. Yep. Clan or tribe. Or tribe. Okay. Since you're here in America, I'd say it was your tribe name. Okay. I'm from the Arapahoes or the Indian <laughs> or the, uh, the Iroquois or the Iowas or the uh, Okabochis or whatever. Oh, you don't sign your last name. No, put your last name on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's your tribe name, okay? That's what I thought. Divine is my tribe name, okay? Okay. <clears throat> At least this go around. I don't know what tribe I was from before, but... Hmm. Any more questions, guys? Oh, that is here for. Go ahead. Well, are we all worn out? Here? Are we all worn out? <laughs> okay. This Did is a lot, you know, a lot more to stew on. But I, you know, I can see even though. It brings up a whole lot of new things. It's really just mod, slight modifications of what we've been doing. Yeah. But with major impact. Pull, yeah. Go in and pull up that uh, advisory. Uh, uh, oh, what the heck? Uh, that private international law. Right. And about the advisory uh, uh, assistant legal advisor. I already posted that, law. Patrick. Huh? Uh, Gabe, uh, you, you posted it in the Skype group. I'll turn them into the post to put on the uh, okay. group. Yeah. Plus the and, definition uh, of the private international law. I, I posted both of those for everybody. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and there's a fax number, so basically you can write up a fax. And uh, uh, now on most all the documents that I'm doing now, I'm putting at the top of the document, uh, even on my faxes, uh, I'm putting uh, at the very top up there uh, up here. your signature by the will. I'm up. putting like civil facts, okay? So I'm calling it a civil facts, not just a facts. Mm. A civil facts, and then priority immediate, and then posted, signed, sealed, and dated on, and then put the date in there, and then by the overstanding will of, and then American PEO slash curator, and then uh, that will be, I'll sign at the very top. I'll, I'm always going to sign over everything that I put below be. from now on be. so that I'm standing over it, and it's by my will. Then I put from, and then basically to uh, the civil principal office holder of that uh, position and then uh, go on with the rest of the facts. Uh, and I modified the facts to fit what I wanted on there. So since I moved some of the stuff around, the date and everything, and I put the page number down at the very bottom, uh, I took some of those things off of the form that I had there before, 
So there again, I'm modifying this document too. I'm creating my own. Are you using the postage stamp on your documents? Yes, at the very bottom, uh, when I get done, uh, I will put a three cent stamp down in the lower right hand corner and basically uh, put my thumbprint over it and then I will emboss it and then put my green seal over the top of the embossing so it stands out. And sign a date to it, right? No, I'm not signing a date and I'm just putting my thumbprint over it. Okay, okay. I got tired of signing and date and everything. <laughs> I've got it signed and dated up to top, so basically, and I will uh, basically put my thumbprint over my signature at the top and emboss that one too. Okay. But we Patrick, if I'm hearing you right, we're we're sending this to the civil office and we're asking for basically the civil action on it then. Yes, that okay. they now have to comply with the civil uh, requirements, like basically uh, the age of 21. That is a civil law out there that we were supposed to become a voter at the age of 21 per the Constitution. Well, that encompasses that if you are a voter, you have to have oversight of part of America, your estate in America. That's what gives you the right to vote, is that you've claimed your estate. So that's what 21 in the Constitution is really addressing. Then the age of 25, it says the age of 25 is when you can be a representative. Well, only a free man can be a representative of another man. So you have to be free at the age of 25. You cannot be under bondage. So half of these people that are holding these offices are holding them illegally because they're under bondage. They have to renounce that bondage in the civil side. See, a civil uh, office holder cannot claim any bondage, any insurance, any liability insurance. They have to be fully accountable for their actions. Hey, Patrick. Yeah. Uh, I'm reading a, a quote off of the uh, – <clears throat> this is off of how to, how to file an investigation and an injunction – uh, from the point of view of the U.S. Uh, Securities Exchange Commission, and the part that they've got down here says the commission files a complaint with the U.S. District Court and asks the court for sanctions or remedy. Often the commissioner asks for the court order called an injunction that prohibits any further act or practices that violates the law or the commission rules. An injunction can also require audits, accounting for fraud, and special supervisory arrangements. In uh, addition, the Secretary, uh, I mean the SEC, can seek uh, civil monetary penalties or the return of illegal profits called disgorgements. The court may also bar or suspend an individual from serving as a corporate officer or a director. The uh, person who violates the court order may be found in contempt and be subject to additional fines or imprisonment. Yeah, I totally agree with all that. <laughs> yeah, well, do you remember when I was telling you yesterday that I thought we ought to go in chambers, that the you can do in chambers because of the trade secrets and the national security of all this fraud going on, is you can move these issues into civil in chambers, in camera, and you can come in under uh, 31 U.S.C. 3730. You remember when I told you about that yesterday? Yeah, but you don't want to reference that, okay? You can have the right to go into chambers just by coming in as the uh, civil curator and that you want to talk to them in their civil office. Okay? Like when the cop pulls up to you, the uh, city policeman, 
you have to address them. Are you approaching me in your public office or in your civil office? If you're approaching me in the public office, I have no uh, contract with you because I have revoked all underwritings. So I cannot uh, contract with you. And uh, if you're approaching me in the civil capacity, what law have I broken in the civil side? What harm have I caused? And basically then, if they proceed, then you can file uh, charges against them. You can even go down to the sheriff's office, and you can come into the sheriff's office and put him in his civil office, and you're coming in as the civil uh, curator, and you can order the rest of that uh, police officer that has caused you harm. You can order that sheriff to go out and confiscate your vehicle if need be and return it back to you because it has been falsely taken by a public person. They're the ones that are at war. You are basically, like Chris said, we are the non-combatant civilian. Now, if the sheriff don't want to operate that way, then you can file charges against him for not operating in his civil office. And that sheriff's office is a civil office. Mm. But see, they're also operating in the public capacity because they have bonds over them, and they're bonded by the insurance company, a liability insurance. But when you expose them to the light, basically then they either have to comply or basically they get burned up like the vampires do in the movies. <laughs> Any other questions? Any comments? Anything? Thank you. I think about the thank yous, Patrick. Okay. Well, we'll so, uh, with that, apply to. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll work it through and get our pull some up more questions based on what you've given us tonight. Okay. Where are yeah, the latest files? Where are the latest files posted? Huh? Where are the on latest the files? Group. Not everybody's on the Skype group. We have to transfer them over to the Yahoo Yahoo group and the uh, the concurrent backup. Okay. Yeah, I'm not on the Skype group. Right. Just a few people are on the Skype group. Hey, Thomas, I've been copying and pasting stuff, so I'll just send you a file that might help you. This is Steve. Yeah. Well, what, what we really need to do is... Uh, if if you want stuff uh, that, that you think should be fa pasted on the group, send it to me in as attachment to an email, and I can upload it. Okay. But you know, go go through, be a good at ed editor, make sure people can read it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm gonna Thanks. call it quits here. I'll thank let you. you guys thank, continue thank, on if you want to. Okay. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Take care. Thank. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Bye. Thomas. Yeah. I'm late on the call as usual, man, and I didn't want to have Patrick keep on reviewing stuff. So um, what happened at the beginning of the call, if you don't mind talking about it? Pardon? I say, um, uh -huh. Can you tell me what, what happened at the beginning of the call? I'm not saying, like, everything, but can you give me a little brief summary, please? Uh, it's, it's a very information-packed call. And you should listen to it uh, when I load it up. Okay, and you'll have it on the uh, Yahoo thing tomorrow or in a few hours or what? 
it, I, I should have be able to have the link up tonight, and I'll probably download the call to concurrent tomorrow. Okay, and 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 were there any files posted? Because Patrick said he couldn't get them on there. No, uh, they talked about a lot of things, and I I would imagine over when Patrick gets his his uh, internet fixed, uh, and I, I I wonder whether there's maybe some people making sure he's down. Yeah, uh, but, me and him talked about that two days ago. I thought the same thing. Uh, and uh, but I'm sure there will be a flurry of new files because he's got new insights, which it, yeah. it seemed to, on the surface, change everything, but it's changing everything just a little bit. Yeah. And yes, but, they are going to give you an update. But in fun, fundamental ways. That's right, from from this public to private thing. Yes. Yeah, in using learning how to access your assistant legal advisor through the private international law and being a curator and knowing how to establish your curator. That and that would be great if that really works out and that he really becomes our, our assistant in figuring this out. Okay, so who are, who is our legal assistant legal uh assistant advisor? You you you'll, you'll get it, it'll get posted. Okay. Okay. I mean, but hold on, let me ask you this so I can just find it myself. Uh, is this from the Treasury Department or, or, or is that from the Philadelphia International uh, Commissioner? No, it's part of Philadelphia is part of it. The uh, Inter- yeah. Secretary of State is part of it. Secretary of State Department is part of it. All right. But the curator. 